loving what you're hearing? Well, the establishment hates it. And right now, they're conjuring up new ways to try and censor RCR. To ensure you never miss a beat of the hard-hitting news you've come to know and love, make sure you're on the RCR mailing list. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Dr. James Kearsted from the New Zealand Initiative is the author of A Damning Report into Academic Freedom in New Zealand Universities. The report is called Unpopular Opinions, and it outlines some alarming details. This report provides a detailed and thoroughly documented examination of the state of academic freedom at our universities, together with an analysis of the main threats to academic freedom in this country at present. Dr. James Kirstead is with me now. Dr. James Kirstead, uh, welcome to The Crunch. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Now, you've uh, authored a report, and I, I saw this come across my desk, and I thought, um, I really need to talk to you about this. Uh, it's uh, a report that you've entitled Unpopular Opinions, Academic Freedom in New Zealand. Um, I think the title describes everything that you're about to tell me, but I'm, I want to hear it from your perspective. What's this report is about and what we should be worried about in New Zealand? Well, it's obviously a report on academic freedom. I mean, that much is pretty clear from the title. The unpopular opinions bit, by the way, comes from the Education Act, which, which says the universities should foster academic freedom, and it partly defines it as the ability to state controversial or unpopular opinions. Um, but yeah, I mean, the main thing we wanted to do for this report was gather the evidence that there is a problem with academic freedom in this country. And I think we found almost too too much evidence. I mean, the report kept being delayed because the universities kept doing things that I wanted to include in the report. Um, so at this point, it's about 55,000 words long. It's got 72 anonymous testimonies from academics. We actually had more than that, but we just chose 72. Mm-hmm. And there were five surveys of students and academics that we sort of reanalyzed and put in a big chapter about the surveys. And then there were 21 academic freedom incidents. So these are incidents in which academic freedom was either clearly violated or very much threatened, or you know the issue of academic freedom hit the papers for whatever reason. Most of them, as, I, as I've just suggested, uh, were already in the public domain and that the press picked them up, but there were three or four that haven't actually been in the public domain before, so we're kind of publishing them as, as journalists. And those ones in the public domain, was one of the ones, um, the case which ended in a court case with Susie Wiles versus the uh, Auckland University? It was, yeah. Yeah. And presumably um, there's people around the outside of that who were giving you information anonymously uh, about this and, and the effect that it had on that department or or the academics themselves. I was in touch with a few people who knew about the situation and had their own opinions on it. Yeah. Um, but actually that one is, as I acknowledge in the acknowledgements inside the uh, front cover, it's one of the only one of those incidents that wasn't actually written up by me, was written up by my colleague, Max Salmon. But yeah. I did follow, follow the case myself, and it's a kind of a complicated one because it seems like the judge in the end pretty clearly stated in her judgment that this was not a case about academic freedom. Mm. Having said that, the judge also said that one thing that Auckland University tried to do, which was to say that when Susie Wiles was talking, you know, putting, sharing her views on the, on the radio or the TV, that wasn't part of her job at Auckland. The judge also clearly stated that that was wrong on the part of the university, i.e. that when Susie Wiles is sharing her opinions on TV or in the media, that is part of her job and she can protect, she can expect the same protections while doing that part of her job as uh, teaching in the classroom. It was an interesting case because clearly her academic freedom wasn't impinged. She she was freely able to go on television and, and radio and write articles and give her opinion and all of those. It didn't seem to be impeded in any way. What she was most upset about was that she got pushback from those for those having those opinions and seemed to think that academic freedom meant you don't get pushback. And, and I struggled with that. It's complicated. I mean, I, I can't remember everything that was all the evidence that was um, adduced at the trial, but I, my understanding from people within the University of Auckland was that there were some quite extreme cases, so it wasn't just pushback of the ordinary sort, like I disagree with your opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, she she claims, I think, that there were death threats and very, fairly extreme threats of that nature. I don't know if they're true. I think that's what she claimed. Um, 
I was, it's also my understanding from people within the University of Auckland that there was at least one occasion on which somebody came to the university to confront her. And she understandably, I think, found that threatening. Uh, however, I think that the university did actually install some added security. I think there was an, uh, an, another door which had a sort of swipe card system added to it. So the university claimed that they did actually take uh, reasonable steps to protect your security. And I, I did read the whole judgment, and, and the judge does actually, you know, give the University of Auckland credit for responding. Uh, she just sort of knocks them down for trying to use the excuse that Susie wasn't really doing her university work on the radio and TV. And, and she, I think the judge also criticizes the university for kind of not going far enough in protecting her. Yeah, I mean, nobody deserves death threats or people confronting you or all of that sort of stuff. But, you know, if you're going to be in public and express an opinion, then you should expect that there will be someone dis disagreeing or uh, dissenting with your opinion. Do you think the academics and the universities have kind of made a rod for them for their own back in the way that they've built over a number of years an attitude that we can say what we like, but we don't want to hear what anybody says in return? Well, yes. I mean, if that's their attitude, I mean, I'm not sure that that's the attitude that comes out from the Susie Wiles case. I mean, I think generally, I mean, I was an academic at Victoria University of Wellington. I mean, mm. my sort of personal opinion is that there's a bit of an ideological bubble and that people can sometimes be oversensitive to this kind of thing, to, to sort of ordinary pushback from, you know, what they would say is kind of beyond the pale politically. But for a lot of people, it's just kind of the normal, uh, you know, the, the right part, the, the right is in the right handed part of the of the political spectrum. Yeah, but I think uh, I think in general, I, I can't think of other cases where people have have sort of complained in that manner. Because that's why the Susie Wiles case is so interesting, mm -hmm. because it sort of breaks new ground in that sense. And I think that that the part of the judge's judgment where she said that, yeah, when you're expressing your views on the radio or on podcasts, you are effectively working as an academic. I think that's going to be significant, mm -hmm. and we'll see how far that goes. Um, but I, I don't think the judge, the judge's statement didn't strike me as just saying, for example, you know, you're not allowed to criticize university academics. And I don't think most universities in New Zealand take the view that you're just not allowed to criticize academics. It, the argument concerns, you know, this more extreme type of criticism, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's, that's difficult because sometimes I, I hear these claims about very extreme criticisms and I don't know if they're true or sometimes people say, well, he said this or they said this. And that strikes me as like, not that big a deal, but then other times, you know, things like death threats, rape threats, that kind of thing, I think is clearly beyond the pale. Well, those so, are actually criminal. So, you know, I mean, there, there is ways that you deal with that. It, it's criminal behaviour, death threats and rape threats and all of those th threatening persons, physical, you know, body. Those are all things that can be dealt with with appropriate laws. Um, anyway, let's put that aside for a bit. In this report, you know, as you said, it's 55,000 um words. What do you see as the main threat that this report has revealed and, and what you've seen from the evidence that you gathered in producing this report? So we actually looked at three main threats. One is sort of um, progressive radicalism uh, on campus on the part of students and university faculty or staff. The mm -hmm. other is the Chinese Communist Party, uh, which is it, which apparently has been interfering with uh, academia, along with sort of other parts of New Zealand life, as people maybe saw in the recent Stuff documentary. And the final threat was what we've called managerialism and the so-called uh, neoliberal university. And this is really university's tendencies to, or a tendency to see themselves first and foremost as a brand that needs to be protected. So the combination of that, that sort of tendency to sort of try and protect the brand at all costs, even from internal criticism, and sort of powerful managers and, and quite sort of steep managerial hierarchies. That's another one of the big threats. The, you did ask me what the biggest one was, so I'm going to have to call it. And I I think that the biggest threat at the moment to academic freedom in New Zealand comes from the progressive left. And that's not because I hate the progressive left all the time. I think, think it has no good points so or that it's completely illegitimate. It just so happens that right now there's a massive political skew in most universities in the English-speaking world, far more people on the left than on the right. And that produces certain dynamics. Uh, the people who are in the center or on the right come to seem like sort of weird others. And I think there's a lot of psychological elements that when people are in these situations, they have a tendency to kind of marginalize those others and sort of bully them. And I think we we see that in universities as well. Do you think this, I mean, let's call it, I mean, I think most people would recognize you know, progressive, a progressive threat is, is woke politics, um, essentially. 
do you think that's being driven out of the U- US and UK and we're sort of like copycatting it or has it got a life of its own? It, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's pervasive. It's not just in academia. It's in all society. And we're seeing mm. you know, all sorts of, uh, well, weird, frankly, um, positions being taken in the interest of being woke or progressive. Yeah, no, I think it's definitely coming from the States. Uh, mostly, it's also coming from the UK. I mean, the thing about New Zealand, kind of like Canada, where I originally come from, is that um, it's a small country. And so we kind of look to the bigger countries for what to do. Even if we're doing that just implicitly, you know, the prestigious places like Harvard and Oxford and Cambridge, you know, they set the tone. And I think there's a lot of what you call woke ideas. We kind of tried to avoid that term in the report because it sounds like an insult, but it's, it is a kind of a useful term. So let's say, you know, these far left are these sort of radical progressive ideas. A lot of them are coming out of these prestigious places in North America and the UK. And I think, you know, a lot of academics in New Zealand think, oh, we should be doing that. Uh, I think it's complicated because there is also kind of like a, a, a New Zealand tradition of uh, progressivism as well. And so, you know, New Zealanders like Linda Smith have actually contributed to uh, post-colonial studies in in quite a seminal way. And so in New Zealand, I think that the bit that we've sort of contributed to most um, on the progressive side of the academic spectrum is uh, post-colonial studies and especially, you know, stuff about Maori, indigeneity, Maturanga Maori, all that kind of thing. Mm. It is pervasive. And and I wonder if we, how you do you know, challenge it in in many respects. Um, you know, we look at uh, just this year watching Harvard cop an absolute flogging because of, and in fact cost their vice chancellor or, or equivalent their job in the end because they were trying to justify something that really wasn't justifiable in the end and it was all around this sort of woke ideology or progressive ideas. What was the example? Do you remember? Uh, I, I can't remember exactly uh, the the details, but I know that uh, the head of Harvard was questioned, uh, I, be- in, I believe, in, in a uh, Senate committee, and uh, it ended up all over the media for the uh, you know diversity policies, et cetera, and ended up costing her a job. Um, yeah, it- no, that was the Israel Palestine issue, I think. Which is kind of an interesting case because people were asking you questions like, "Should you be allowed to say, basically?" Kind ah, of, that's right. Yes, it's basically a lot of those statements that the the uh, Congress people in Congress, the representatives were asking about, were sort of borderline incitement to violence about Jews, mm. and she was, and the president was saying that we should defend people's freedom of speech, which in a sense is the right answer, but it's just sort of spectacularly hypocritical because only a few years ago we we're having the same debates around taboos on the left. And the universities weren't particularly brave about defending free speech. Mm. So that is interesting. I mean, I will say on that front that there have been in recent times, like a lot of people on the left being canceled for that kind of opinion, not only in universities, but also outside with the assassination of Donald Trump. People who said that, you know, they would have enjoyed that or something. They're getting fired from their jobs. So I don't agree with that either. No, so that's just proof of what I kind of said at the beginning, right? That like it's not necessarily that I have a big problem with the progressive left. It's just that they they are the hegemonic force at the moment, and they're especially the hegemonic force in universities, and that kind of produces these dynamics. But where's this coming from? Like, I get this asked this all the time. You know, is there some guiding hand? You know, is there some sort of master left wing conspiracy to do all of these things that we're talking about, or is it just organic and growing a life of its own? Yeah, I think it's more the latter. I mean, you may know that Eric Kaufman uh, has come out with a book recently on this, and his theory is that it's this sort of emergent phenomenon. In other words, it's the product of lots of interactions, lots of individual decisions. It produces this huge uptick in this kind of identity stuff. David Rosado, who's a computer scientist at Otago Polytechnic, he's produced these amazing graphs where he's basically gotten a computer program to scan all the main US newspapers. He's done it in the UK as well in Spain. And he looks at particular terms, and he's looked at terms like racist, sexist, homophobic. He calls them prejudice-denoting terms. And there's just this huge spike after 2000, actually actually before 2016, so just before Trump comes in. So it's not completely a reaction to Trump, although Trump seems to sort of pour fire on the, or fuel on the fire. But yeah, I mean, it, it just sort of shows objectively, I think, what a lot of us have perceived, a lot of us have intuited over the past few years, that there's just been this huge kind of tidal wave of identitarian left ideology and ideas. 
Mm. And uh, yeah, as I say, I don't think there's anyone directing it because, you know, it almost gives too much credit to any individual to be able to organize it because it's such a broad, such a large phenomenon it's going on not only in the U.S., but like across the English speaking world, at least, and arguably in some European countries as well. So I, I think that part of the conditions for that were laid earlier. I mean, I think when I was at, so I, I did my PhD at Stanford and when I was there, so that was sort of 2007 to 2013, I felt fine. I, I, I wasn't, I didn't think of myself as on the right at that point, actually, but I didn't think that if people were conservative, they would be discriminated against. I didn't think people would be canceled. I didn't think talks would be shut down. But I, I knew and I recognized that it was a very kind of lefty campus. And I just mm -hmm. sort of thought, oh, that I just happened to be at Stanford. Maybe other places are different. And then you sort of start to realize as you go to conferences that, you know, there are some it, people can be open minded about a lot of topics as long as they aren't the sort of uh, hot button ones. But on certain topics, it's very difficult to disagree. And you soon find that you're sort of in a minority of one. Uh, so that I think that the conditions were really this imbalance that existed before. And for whatever combination of reasons, that kind of that was sort of fuel waiting to be lit. And at some point after Trump's or around the time of Trump's inauguration, uh, somebody threw a match onto that fuel and it just sort of blew up. And now we're in these sort of burning culture wars. I wonder, you know, if you look at some debates where there is an accepted norm, climate change is a perfect example of that, right? And, and you can look in New Zealand, in the New Zealand academic system, and, and you can look at perhaps uh, health advocacy, particularly out of the University of Otago, where contrarian views are discouraged and they're discouraged overtly either by shunning somebody who might be an academic. And I spoke a couple of weeks ago to um, Professor Mari Raglover, and she has been effectively in New Zealand shut out of any debate on tobacco control, even though she has 31 years experience in, in studying tobacco, tobacco control methods, is a recognised expert in dealing with addictive substances, those sorts of things. But... You will never hear her on any, you know, we won't hear her on Radio New Zealand. You won't hear her, see her on TVNZ, for example. And she's been shut out because she has a contrarian view that's not the official dogma of tobacco control, which is nicotine is evil and big tobacco are evil, yeah. uh, you know, and all those things. Climate change is another. If you've got a contrarian view on that, you know, you're now a lunatic. You get shunned. You're not, you know, they come out with things like 1,500 climate scientists all agree on this, and therefore we must all agree on it. Where that leads to as well is is a silencing of those contrarian views because they no longer get funded in the funding round. Do, do you think that has a significant uh, aspect in the in silencing contrarian views? I mean, what? I definitely I'm think so, yeah. Funding is a tricky one because we didn't actually get time to look into that specifically. Uh, we, we thought about trying to do a study just of, of funding and ideology and funding applications and also at ethics committees you know these committees that sort of judge whether your your experiment or your study can go ahead because of ethics concerns and nowadays which you know makes sense if they're dealing with like animals or something but nowadays they often seem to have this element of you know it needs to respect the treaty of waitangi even though it might not seem clear to might not seem obvious to people designing these experiments or studies that their their study actually has anything to do with the treaty of waitangi so yeah, I think that these funding decisions and ethics boards do play a role. We didn't look at them specifically, but um, we had a lot of testimonies from academics, well, 72, as I said earlier. And uh, in a lot of those testimonies, people say that, yeah, if you don't, well, you know, again, there's probably a broad field of, of action where you can sort of make decisions about what you're going to study and you'll be fine. But if you go against the orthodoxy on these key issues, you know, ethnicity and sexuality and sex and gender, those types of things, then... Yeah, you know, a lot of academics told us they think that their career is going to be harmed by that. They're not going to get the grant. They're not going to get the promotion. And uh, they may even get in trouble uh, of some sort. Well, it's a bit of a chilling effect, isn't it? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it's interesting you told me that story about, sorry, what was the name of the lady, Glover? Uh, Mari with Glover, Professor yeah, Mari. So I'd be interested to hear more because this is the problem with this report is that we kept hearing more stories. And um, some of the times like people would say, oh, I remember this thing happened why don't you ask this person and we'd email that person and they'd say, sorry, can't, uh, no can do, you know, we'd love to talk to you, but I signed a non-disclosure agreement. 
but I see quite a lot of, again, like we we haven't done an actual empirical study of how many non-disclosure agreements are out there, but we heard a lot of cases of people saying, you know, we can't talk to you about this because I've signed a non-disclosure agreement. We even heard uh, from one relatively senior professor who said that he basically had a non-disclosure agreement universally imposed on him by the university who basically said, don't talk about this topic or we will get rid of you. Um, so, I mean, it's a serious impingement on academic freedom, isn't it? Well, that's right. So that's just someone's claim. It hasn't been confirmed, but I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that we've been hearing. And, and my impression is that these non-disclosure agreements are actually quite widespread and, you know, people say, okay, they sign these all the time in the public service and in other private companies. Fine. But it's like, these are universities. They're meant to be places of free speech and free inquiry. Why do they feel the need to sign these agreements? I, I, I don't really understand that. I mean, I'm struggling with it as well because I've always viewed university as being a place where you test ideas or hypothesis or you have an experiment and you see if it can be replicated and then someone will say, well, hang on, you've done that slightly wrong there. Maybe if you'd done it this way, we'd have a better, different result. It's all about testing and retesting until you can prove your point. Yeah, that's right. I mean, to be fair, like some of these non-disclosure agreements, the university might be afraid of just sort of ordinary kind of sour grapes or something. But still, you'd think that the right approach there would just be to sort of let the person have their say and then rebut their criticisms if, if they're able to. The second threat you mentioned was the CCP. And I've long thought that the CCP was a threat, not just in academia, but in New Zealand society in general. And that's from my own personal observations. I mean, I was brought up in a highly political household. My father was the president of the National Party for a time. And I remember him when I was a kid getting phone calls from the consul general, the Chinese consul general or the ambassador, asking him as the president of the party to go and tell ministers, MPs to pull their head in. And that was a our overt political involvement by a foreign power and the diplomatic corps to influence New Zealand politics. Mm. We've seen also the CCP infiltrating political parties, most notably National and Labour, mm. and then being you know, people who are highly connected uh, with the CCP, even though they'll say they're not. The reality is if someone comes out of China with millions of dollars, that's with the approval of the government and the CCP. And they've had donations and all of that that have been traced back to CCP-connected companies, et cetera, in China. And that's evidence in court, right? So it's been tested. It's been found that that's where the money came from, and we've got that influence. And then you've got the famous cases like Professor Anne-Marie Brady, who is the, probably the most prominent researcher who has come under intense pressure from CCP operatives and people. That's a huge threat, not just from this, you know, we've got woke ideology, that's a threat all by itself, but now you've got a pernicious bad actor playing with academic freedom. No, I agree. I mean, we wrote up several episodes, several sort of academic freedom incidents on this. They cluster around 2018, 2020, as I said at the beginning. So it may be that universities in New Zealand have sort of caught on to this threat and have taken measures to sort of be safer or, you know, put some security measures in place. Or it may be that the Chinese Communist Party is just more successfully kind of getting away with it and being more subtle, it's hard to tell. Um, there was a big debate about Confucius Institutes. Um, I think some of those still exist, though. I think, I, I mean, I read a lot of reports from other think tanks abroad, like in Australia and the UK. There's one for the Civitas think tank by Robert Clark, where one of the things they do is they look at various ostensibly kind of academic programs that the Chinese have, China has, runs with English-speaking countries and other countries. And it kind of, uh, and that these reports kind of bring evidence to bear that suggests that, yeah, some of these programs are legitimate and academic and they're pretty innocent, but some of them have these strange features. For example, some of them are linked to these kind of military backed universities. So there's seven universities in China called the, um, the sons, the seven sons of national defense. And, uh, they are linked very closely with the people's liberation army. And so there are a few cases in other countries where there's been a kind of academic exchange and the academic coming to the West has just happened to also be, you know, in the People's Liberation Army. So they're actually part of the security state. Robert Clark's uh, report for Civitas also went into the Chinese Scholarship Council scholarships, and he just looked at some of the language that they were using 
for scholarship applicants in China. So these are scholarships for Chinese students to come to the West. And if you read the small print or you read the Chinese characters, they actually say, you know, we're selecting people who are, you know, good communists effectively, and we want you to go spread communism abroad, or, you know, whatever they say, Xi Jinping thought, they use some other uh, euphemism. But so there, I, I, I could go on in that vein, but there are several of these programs that people have raised suspicions about. And um, it, it seems like some of them are around in New Zealand. So, for example, Confucius Institutes are still around in New Zealand. It doesn't mean that everyone involved with the uh, Confucius Institute is a spy. We need to shut them down immediately. That's not what we recommend in the report. What mm. we recommend is just we need to be a lot more cautious about these things. Just take a step back and review them. And if we want to have um, intellectual and academic contacts with the Chinese, which obviously we do because they're the second biggest country in the world, uh, you know, we just have to make sure that we're doing ones which are, you know, really have no suspicion of being part of the security apparatus. You know, we don't have to have these exchanges with universities that are linked to the military. We could have exchanges with other universities. So I think there's some pretty kind of pragmatic and sense, sort of commonsensical steps we could take to continue to engage with the Chinese, which we need to do, but also, um, you know, just be sensible about our own security. I mean, it's not the Chinese people, is it? It's that it's the state apparatus, the CCP controlled organizations. That's right. Like these universities, and I'm, if, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure that that national candidate who ended up being an MP was a former PLA in, instructor at one of those universities. Right. I think that's true. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. It's not the Chinese people themselves. And in fact, a lot of Chinese people actually, you know, want what you and I want. They want to be free. They want to be able to speak freely. And some of them come to the West precisely for that reason. So that's something that came out very strongly in that stuff documentary, where they talk to a lot of Chinese, you know, ethnic Chinese people in New Zealand who come from China precisely as dissidents. And that shows up in our academic freedom incidents as well. So one of them is one of them involves this student called Serena Lee, who was putting out pro Hong Kong independence posters at University of Auckland. And I think they got torn down or they got covered over. And then these, there's actually a video of this quite interesting. You see these three or four Chinese men turn up uh, who start sort of berating her in Chinese and saying that, you know, she shouldn't be doing this. And I think she's sort of chanting national slogans at her. And she ends up on the floor. I mean, one of them kind of pushes her. It's not like a huge push uh, or like a punch to the face or anything, but she kind of ends up on the floor because of this. So, I mean, that, that person is obviously an example of someone who is Chinese but who doesn't like the Communist Party. And there are a lot of people in that camp and we should be trying to defend them and sort of, you know, if they've come to the West, partly to get away from that because they value free speech and things, we should stand up for those values. Yeah, I mean, it's widely reported around the world in other, in other jurisdictions that there's a network of informers. People have come here for whatever reason, but are sympathetic to the regime in China and actually dob in there fellow citizens. Um, yeah, it's very tricky. I mean, one of the big problems is, you know, if uh, the Education Act defines academic freedom as the freedom of academics or students to basically state controversial opinions and say what they want. And that's, well, it should be easy enough, but it's at the moment it seems hard enough just for New Zealand students and academics. But there's also this problem in the case of the CCP that we get a lot of Chinese students coming from mainland China and then wanting to go back. And in Australia, at least, there was one incident that we know of where a uh, student posted on Facebook pro-democracy messages from Australia. And that student, I think that student's family was then arrested in China. So that's a really tough situation that we can't really do much about in New Zealand. That, you know, Chinese students coming here, tragically, they're you know, wanting to kind of participate in democratic and liberal debate. They are at risk of being uh, persecuted when they go back to China. Or their family persecuted. Or their family, that's right, yeah. But again, it becomes chilling. I mean... Um... Is part of this problem with dealing with the CCP threat in our universities for academic freedom part of the makeup of New Zealand in that we're pretty relaxed about anybody coming here? We're pretty welcoming, uh, especially in places like universities, to other people, other cultures. Yeah, yeah. And, and we don't have in the forefront of our mind that actually – uh, some of the people that are coming here are not coming here for good with good intentions. Uh, it's a tough thing with China. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things going on. I think one of them is just this idea that, you know, we, we don't want to be racist. We want to be welcoming to immigrants. But also with China, there was this, there was this movement, uh, you know, in the political class around like the time that David Cameron was prime minister in the, in the UK. This, he really exemplifies this so after around 2010. 
his whole strategy was we need to engage more with China because that will help China democratize. You know, as China, you know, rubs shoulders with people in the West, these values will get passed on. Also, they'll become richer. There was the idea that as the society became developed, that it would become freer. And frankly, that hasn't happened. And I think that in recent years, we've seen a kind of pullback from that as people have realized, yes, they're not exactly the Marxists of Mao anymore, and they're they're more liberal when it comes to economics. But they're still, you know, not all of them, obviously, most of them are Ch- just Chinese people. And some of them are actually, as I said, sort of dissidents, they want to come here for free speech. But you have to be aware that this country is run by a communist dictatorship, and that's very dangerous. So as I say, like, we, yes, we want to engage with them, especially the kind of vast majority of students who are here just to study. Uh, but also, we just want to take some sort of sensible steps to kind of review these programs that have links with the People's Liberation Army or the you know Chinese Communist Party directly. We don't, we're not sure we should be engaged with those programs in particular. We've seen that here, though, in New Zealand, too, that same sort of attitude as David Cameron, most notably with uh, with John Key. We're also seeing now Don Brash talking in pro-Chinese, you know, manners, and Helen Clark as well. Yeah, and, it was interesting. Don Brash and Helen Clark wrote, wrote a uh, column, didn't they, for the Herald? I think where they yeah. sort of argued in, in favor of more engagement with the Chinese. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as I say, like they're right in the sense that yes, we need to engage with the Chinese. They're hugely important. They're our biggest trading partner. They're the second biggest country in the world. On the academic front, also, you have to say that they've. In some ways, they've done a great job with their education system. They, they have really high achievement in math at school level. And so there's things that we can learn from them. But, you know, it just makes sense to be a little bit careful. And if we're engaging them with them in some program, that program should be entirely academic. It shouldn't be one where, oh, you know, the scholar we're going to send you just happens to be a major in the in the National Army of China. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was looking back on my political history and you know, I, I was a big advocate for the same sort of things that David Cameron was talking about. If we trade with China, then they'll become wealthier, then people, when they get, get wealthier, uh, become aspirational, and that will, you know, override that communist dictatorship type thing. And, and I've completely changed my mind on all of that uh, after seeing the pervasive way that the CCP infiltrated political parties tried to dominate debate. And then, of course, uh, we had the COVID um, stuff where the CCP was actively working hand in glove with the WHO and various other you know organizations around the world to hush up. That's my feeling. You know, I, I might be wrong on that, but hush up the origins of, of all of this. And you saw this, I don't know, this almost somersaulting by... Quango organizations like the WHO, we don't want to be racist. We don't want to call every other virus in the world's named after where it came from, right? But all of a sudden now we have this made up name and we're seeing the same sort of pervading attitudes with the supposed monkeypox. We're not allowed to call it monkeypox. We have to call it mpox. And it's this, it's almost being driven by people who have very strong academic credentials that mm. we don't want to offend anybody. And in the per- process of not offending anybody, we're glossing over what the actual situation may be. Yeah. I mean, it may it may still be the case that if we engage with China more, or at least it may still be the case that as China gets richer, it'll get more free. The point is just that right now we should be under no illusions that it's still a communist autocracy. And, you know, and it's also a communist, I think for New Zealand especially, it's a communist autocracy that is, you know, several times our weight. I think maybe if you're the, the US or even the UK, you can take a slightly more blasé um, attitude towards China, even though, of course, in those countries, the Chinese will be the Chinese security apparatus will be even more you know, interested in in interfering and and penetrating their sort of their own defenses. But um, with New Zealand, I think we're just very small, and it's clear that China is interested, you know, not only in the South China Sea but also in influencing the Pacific. And it's not that we're sort of so far away that they don't care. We're also, you know, an English-speaking country, and we're in the Five Eyes. Um, uh, security uh, you know, information exchange network, and so it's possible that China sees us as the sort of soft underbelly of the of the Anglophone alliance. So we just, as I say, like I'll just reiterate it again: like we need to be on our guard. However, it would be insane to sort of completely pull back, you know, ban Chinese students or like ban research collaborations with the Chinese. That would be absolutely foolish. We don't want to do that. We just want to. Be a bit sensible and you know look, take a hard look at these at these collaborative programs. 
But you, you're right about their interest in the Pacific. It's not that we're a long way away. I mean, I was born in Fiji, and I have a close interest in what's going on in Fiji, and I'm watching China investing in their um, supplying funds for um, you know the University of South Pacific, all of these sorts of things going on in Fiji. And people say to me, well, why would F China care about Fiji? And I said, well, there's all these submarine networks all across the Pacific that are running the internet, and almost all of them pass through Fiji. At some point, they come up, go down in Fiji. So I can understand why they would want to infiltrate a country that doesn't have the same sort of rigor in politics or, or um, even in the state sector to say, no, we don't want to have Huawei, you know, things in our uh, electronics or communications infrastructure because we don't want to give China a backdoor entry into, into that network. But it's happening. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing, and part of that also is in New Zealand, of course, a lot of the internet um, is controlled out of academia, out of universities, and, and, and an adjunct to that. So I can see there being a real push on that in order to control con communications protocols. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I don't know exactly what their strategy is or what their tactics are, but um, I mean, if we think about the particular evidence that we've put in this report about the Chinese threat, I mean, one of them is Anne-Marie Brady, as you mentioned, who claims that her house was burgled by the Chinese. I think those are very plausible claims. People who've watched the stuff documentary will know also there was the matter of a, a car with, I think, two Chinese dissidents in it that sort of disappeared. Uh, so, I mean, there's, uh, she, uh, she was, Memory Brady was talking about that in the documentary. And then there's the Serena Lee cases that I talked about before, where it's more to do with sort of protests. And then um, it seems like the these people sort of show up. Uh, it's not clear whether they're students or, or, or members of the public, whatever, mainland Chinese sort of people, characters sort of turn up and, and try and sort of berate the person for being pro Hong Kong. So, I mean, it's not as bad as in Australia. I think there was some sort of more full on episodes. Actually, no, the, uh, one, one thing I would like to get in one episode I almost forgot was AUT. So AUT, there was this lecturer, uh, Ji Wan, I believe his name was, who uh, booked a room in order to have an event commemorating the Tiananmen Square massacres. So this is obviously in 2019 which I guess would have been, what, the 40th anniversary of Tiananmen Square. And um, the Chinese embassy or the Chinese consulate actually wrote to Auckland University of Technology, basically wrote to the top brass, the vice chancellor and other senior administrators and said, basically, we don't like this. Can we meet about this? And they actually met with them. And all the emails, we've, they're available because someone put in an official information act request. And we've, put, we've excerpted a lot of them in our write-up of the episode. But it really is kind of astounding to read that. I mean, to be fair... The vice chancellor of AUT does say something like, you have to appreciate, he says this to the Chinese vice consul general, you have to appreciate we have a strong tradition of free speech in this country. So he has that in his email, but he also says something like, it's very convenient that you've written to us because actually it just so happens that this lecturer booked this room on a day when the university was officially closed. I think it was a public holiday. And so he's basically saying, we're really happy that, you know, we can kind of do this. We can cancel this event. Whereas what he probably should have done is reach out to the lecturer. Well, first of all, say clearly to the Chinese embassy to butt out. It's not their business. But then maybe reach out to the lecturer who booked the room. If it really was a problem that it was booked on a public holiday, you know, say to him, you can you can hold it on this day or that day. But instead, they seem to have canceled the event. Not only that, but they sent, I think it's described in the emails as a light security presence to the event, just in case anybody turned up in order to kind of shoot them away and say that the event was canceled. <laughs> so that kind of thing, I mean, I just think it's it's incredible to me that the higher ups didn't think that they might, you know, get in trouble if this came out. They didn't even seem to sort of didn't seem to sort of cross their minds that this is an inappropriate way of dealing with the Chinese embassy, you know. But I mean, I think it reflects what you said at the beginning. There's a lot of dependency on China, something like 11 percent of university revenues in New Zealand. Uh, come from international students and the biggest single group of international students, I think it's something like 30%, about a third is from China. And there's all these research collaborations as well. Actually, Australia has more of those, but New Zealand does have a few as, as well, and they can be highly lucrative. So yeah, I just think universities sort of need to be clear that they're actually legally mandated to protect free speech. So that should actually come above uh, this concern for um, 
for Chinese money. Does that link to your third point or third threat, managerial neoliberal threat and yes. the activity of the managers? There's funding at risk here potentially from international students or actual money that's coming out of China and they're acting to protect that. And are they a business or is this something that, that should be concerning? I mean, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the state funding everything. Yeah. Well, this is the funny thing. I mean, we wrote the chapter on neoliberalism and, you know, people in the initiative are generally pretty pro uh, free enterprise. And I'm, I'm in favor of free enterprise as well. But it's an open question whether the precise way that we marketize the universities and open them to competition in the raw genomics period, whether that was, you know, whether we got all aspects of that right. I think that, you know, it, it's good to have competition. There's lots of evidence from other spheres of life that competition can drive up standards. But um, in some ways, seeing students as customers isn't quite the right way of seeing them because it leads to the situation where the administrators and the, some of the academics kind of bend over backwards to please the students. And they sort of get, they're quite easy to scare, it seems like in a lot of these incidents. Sometimes it's just sort of one student who will complain about something. And then immediately the administrators will put out a statement of some sort. I think one of the episodes that involved that was Raymond Richards, who was this lecturer at Waikato, and he had a Facebook post about Islam. He, he said something like, can you trust an employee who prays five times a day? So it's like, it's an opinion. I, I don't know if I share it, but yeah, that was his opinion. And immediately, I think Waikato, the communications director, put out the statement. And I think in those situations, the administrators are thinking, oh no, we're going to get a really bad reputation. But I actually think that most New Zealanders know that universities are supposed to be places of free speech. I actually think that they're probably doing more harm to the university's reputation by clamping down on sort of opinions like that than, you know, than they would just by sort of letting people speak freely. Well, we saw that with Don Brash, didn't we, with an event that was organised at Massey and all of a sudden turned into an absolute debacle. Um, yeah. where he wasn't able to speak and they, they shut him down and they used spurious term. You know, they said it was a health and safety issue. Oh, yeah, that brings us on to a whole other subject, which is safetyism. But no, I mean, before we get there, that was probably the, the most spectacular example of this tendency of overpowerful managers to sort of shut things down. I mean, the thing about ma managerialism is that we sort of initially thought it was going to be another kind of cause of the free speech crisis, the academic freedom crisis, alongside the CCP and um, progressive radicalism. But actually, it's kind of different in its nature. It's, it's sort of like the lever or the, or the node through which these threats go. Because the progressive radicalism in the Chinese Communist Party wouldn't be that much of a problem if the administrators could just be trusted to protect free speech, right? If when the Chinese embassy wrote to AUT, they just responded curtly but politely, you know, basically, this is none of your business, uh, that would have stopped it in its tracks. And it's the same thing with a lot of these progressive radicals, like the student radicals will say, basically, this academic needs to be in trouble. And if the, if the administrators could be trusted just to be like, you're just one student, we have a duty to protect free speech, plug off, or something more polite. Uh, but what we see in the, in the case of the Don Brash deplatforming is not only administrators, very senior administrators who aren't standing up for free speech when they come under pressure, it's actually the highest administrator, the highest sort of manager of the university, the vice chancellor herself, Jan Thomas. She's the one who starts the cancellation. Like she finds out, I think someone writes to her about this event, which is actually a politics society, a student politics society who have invited John Brash to give a talk about his career in politics. And you see again in the emails, they're available online because somebody put in an Official Information Act request. She immediately writes to her other higher ups and starts saying things like, what are the options for shutting this down? He is very racist. You know, so it's clearly her political opinions. And she even actually, I think, asks, I think she asked this twice when people didn't answer initially. She asks about defunding student groups. So immediately her thought is, I don't like the student group inviting Don Brash. I'm going to shut down the student group, which is obviously against what the Education Act says about how both academics and students have the right to explore ideas. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I really don't like the tendency nowadays of people trying to get others canceled and fired. However, <laughs> I will say, if you're the vice chancellor of a university and you're bound by the Education Act to protect freedom of speech, and you not only fail to do that, but you are the main <laughs> threat yourself, I find it very difficult to understand how she kept her job, but hopefully she's learned from that episode. I'm not one for cancellation. If if there's someone who is coming to New Zealand to speak or is speaking at a university and I don't agree with them, well, I just don't go. 
<laughs> well, yeah, there's lots, lots of options. If you don't like it, if you really think it's terrible and you won't be able to live through it, just don't go to the talk. If you disagree with it, another option is you can go to the talk, you stick your hand up at the end, and you say, Mr. Lomborg, I don't agree with what you said about climate change because I have the following considerations. You know, I read a book about it and I, and I said that. What do you think of that? You can go to it and record it or take notes and you can write a letter to the newspaper the next day. I mean, nowadays, of course, there are any number of options. You can go on Twitter. You can literally sit in the talk and say, you know, Lomborg is saying this. This is false. Look at this graph, right? So mm. I don't understand why we have to shut these talks down at all. And part of that is the safety. I mean, maybe it's a good, good time to get, get to that because a lot of these episodes, they involve the, the reason that these things are shut down ultimately is because people bring in these claims of safety. And that's also one that was involved in the in the Massey case with uh, Don Brash that people started saying. I was going to well, raise it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go I can't on. raise it. You know, like in 1944, 18-year-olds were charging off landing craft into machine gun nests and artillery and everything else, um, you know, with the D-Day landings. Now 18-year-olds seem to have safe spaces and they've got all these people wanting to protect them and they're wrapped in cotton wool and there's a layer of bubble wrap around that and then a helmet on as well. Are we weakening society by trying to protect young people from dangerous ideas or, or just ideas. Yes. I mean, we're, we're only weakening, weakening society. I mean, we're weakening society specifically in the sense that liberal democratic society, like the, the society we actually value and that those people in World War II were protecting, it's very difficult for that to function if people aren't able to exchange ideas. And they're not going to be able to exchange ideas if every time somebody hears something that offends them, they try and shut an event down. I mean, this is also something that, that like, we kept having incidents that occurred while we were trying to finish up the report and we couldn't get them in. But one of them was the postponement of Nick Smith's free speech event at Vic. And there was a student representative who went on to the platform with Sean Plunkett. And one of the things she said was, it was a dangerous situation because if it had taken place in the hub, there may have been students passing by who heard things that those people were saying, those people being my colleague Michael Johnston and Jonathan Ailey of the Free Speech Union, who are, if that's your idea of a kind of alt-right provocateur who's going to damage you by their speech, then... You've got another thing coming. But it, so this kind of language is actually pervasive. You read through our academic freedom incidents again and again, people appeal to that. Um, and sometimes like th there was one episode with uh, flyers at the University of Auckland, which did. I actually looked at the evidence and some of the posters and people said they were white supremacist groups. I do think maybe those groups were white supremacists, but immediately everyone said we have to take down all the posters because uh, the students are going to be unsafe. But it's like, was there actually any evidence that the students were going to be literally unsafe? I still don't think so. I mean, I, I think it's good to train students to be able to cope with ideas that they don't like and the idea that other people are discussing ideas that they don't like. I mean, the final thing I'll say on this is that it's not only weakening society, it's weakening the students themselves, and it's making them less happy. I mean, that's the argument of Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff in their book, The Coddling of the American Mind. And the point of that is just that there's all sorts of evidence from psychology that exposure, you know, controlled exposure in an actually safe environment, you know, but safe in the old sense of like you're not literally being beaten up or something, that actually helps you become stronger. So if students are saying, I cannot deal with somebody with different political views speaking in front of me, the answer to that is not to force them into the room, but to encourage them. Why don't you try? Like, what if you go to this talk? And you you sit down. If if you feel really terrible, you can leave the room. But just try and see if you can like bear it. And so there is some evidence for a kind of student mental health crisis. Some people think they've just sort of broadened the terms depression and anxiety too much. But I think there's probably a real effect as well. And I think that this is probably worsening it that you're telling students you can't cope with ideas when the reality is they probably can cope with people disagreeing with them and they can cope with actually answering back and asking questions and things like that too. Isn't that the key? Finding, I mean, I guess if you look at all of these threats, progressive threat, wokeism, safetyism, managerialism, the CCP, we're closing down and homogenizing thought or speech in our universities, which is where everybody goes to get degrees to end up working in the civil service or the professional classes or lawyers, um, accountants, all of that. And they're not being exposed to any opinions that are there's this orthodoxy that of what's accepted and what's not. We're setting our society up for failure, ultimately, when we're cosseting and and you know to use that term coddling the minds of young people 
in how we teach them, and then they're going to go out into the world and experience real life, and it's going to smack them in the face real hard. And then they say, well, we ha- we're not used to this. We don't like what we're hearing. I'm being told to come to work at 8 o'clock on Monday, <laughs> you know, this sort of thing. And then they build this inside the organisations they're working for, government organisations, private companies, and we spread this wokeism in fiction and all these other things into society in general and end up with a weaker society as a result because nobody's been challenged about anything. Yeah, no, I think it's very dangerous. I mean, I think it's also bad for academic research. I mean, there was an organization started in the States a few years ago, Heterodox Academy, that you might have heard of. Yep. And the whole point of that, that was also started by Jonathan Haidt, incidentally. And the whole point of that was basically, if you're doing research on a particular topic, let's say sex and gender, and everybody who's working on that comes from a kind of cultural point of view, a left postmodern cultural point of view, you're going to produce worse research because there are all these points that people who are, say, evolutionary psychologists or you know, take a more kind of binary view of sex could challenge, you could sort of put when you presented your work that would actually improve it, even if you don't agree with that view, right? The mm-hmm. fact that you have to deal with objections is going to strengthen your own work. I mean, I do think, I will say again, that there's plenty of good work being done in the universities. There's plenty of good teaching and research being done. Uh, you know, the average sort of chemistry seminar isn't crazy woke. Maybe, maybe it's a little bit woke around the edges, but there are a lot of people who are doing good work and they can explore ideas within certain parameters. But the problem is there are these particular topics where it's very, very difficult to talk about anything. And, and those are the ones where we risk getting things really quite wrong, I think. So, you know, ethnicity and race and sex and gender. And uh, not only is there a risk of getting things wrong, but I just think in and of itself, like if you take the view that actually there are just two sexes and you want to state that in a university class, you should be able to just because you, you were living in a free country, right? It's sort of outrageous to me that or if you're a politics group, you want to have Don Brash come and give a talk. It's just bizarre to me that we're going to let this be shut down by some kind of more powerful person in the university. I think people have a right to discuss things. Which then leads to, I guess, probably, you know, summing up, I guess, is what sort of guardrails should be put in place so that we can prevent this ideological capture, whether it's the Communist Party of China or um, our radical you know, leftist, feminists, or whatever, uh, effectively capturing the minds of our best students or workers because they've got biased professors. Yeah, well, there are a lot of problems at the university, and we can't deal with them all in one sort of blow or one reform program or individual reform. So I actually think that with the universities, so with, with these sort of deplatformings and, and cancellations and the academic freedom issue, we actually need new legislation. So I think we need something along the lines of the UK's higher education. Freedom of Speech Act, which unfortunately it looks like the Labour government might try to repeal, but yeah. it was put through. It did receive royal assent by the previous Conservative government. And what that does is, is that it sets up a free speech czar at the government level in the Office for Students, which is the UK's uh, university regulator. And it also introduces a new tort. So that's a civil wrong that would allow students and academics whose free speech rights have been violated to effectively take the, their um, persecutors, I guess, to court. You know, so if you have your talk shut down, there's a complaints process, which is non-legal, but there's also a legal process, which in extreme cases you can use. And I think that that would help a lot, even if people didn't use it, because it would put that question into the counselor's mind, like, are we actually going to get taken to court for this? Mm. Um, so I think we need something like that. The Free Speech Union is actually going to do their own report, and that's going to come out in November. And they've looked at all these legislative options, and they're going to recommend something. So I won't steal their thunder too much. In our report, we actually have a few recommendations of our own, which we think will also help. So one thing is that we think there should be an audit of free speech or academic freedom at every New Zealand university every year, uh, probably led by the government, because I'm not sure we can trust the universities to do it well themselves. And that would include a survey of of academics and students, and it would include a list of any free speech or academic freedom incidents that have occurred during that year. Uh, Well, I've said this before, we think that universities should continue to collaborate with China, but we should also review any kind of CCP linked programs. We think that university administrators should receive more training about uh, academic freedom, what it is, and what their obligations are to it in the Education Act. And finally, I mean, uh, maybe as part of that training, we should move away from emphasizing safety, at least safety should go back to what it used to mean, which is that, you know, you're safe from like a fire burning everybody, you know, killing everybody. Uh, You're safe from, you know, thieves coming in from the street or something. 
but you're not safe from ideas. Exposing yourself to ideas and, and words is actually the point of the university. It's like, I think an American commentator used the analogy of you going into the gym and saying, these weights are too heavy. Let's get rid of all these dumb weights. The weights are the point, right? This is the same thing with ideas at the university. You're there to expose yourself to ideas which are going to challenge you. And in exposing yourself to those ideas, you form thoughts that give you a toolkit to counter those ideas in another scenario. Well, that's right. I mean, ideally, people will be exposed to, these are young people who are going to be exposed to ideas across the political spectrum. Maybe if they come in more conservative, they'll be exposed to more liberal ideas. Well, definitely that's going to happen nowadays. And that's, this is actually a good thing in itself, I think. But hopefully we'll get back to a situation someday where if you come in very left-wing, you'll also be exposed to right-wing ideas. And the point isn't to kind of convert people to the other side. It's just to make sure that they you know, get a full sense of how the world is and what opinions other people have. And it's kind of like what we do here at Reality Check Radio, right? We expose our listeners to differing ideas, political, or in my case, it's political, you know, those sorts of things, because it's a political show, but expose people to those different ideas and concepts and and actually try and get the people that we're talking to have a good say so that they can impart that information. I mean, it's protected in our Bill of Rights, right, with the right to receive information, not just the right to speak. It's the right to receive as well. That's right. They have, there are also listeners' rights, right? Like if you're a student group and you want to hear Don Brash speak, mm-hmm. I think you should have a, In fact, you do, as you point out, you do have the right to do that. Yeah, I mean, a good example would be Candace Owen, who's coming to New Zealand, I think, in November. Now, I think I she's a terrible anti-Semite, and, and, I, and I have no truck with many of her views. Should she be blocked from coming to New Zealand? Absolutely not. Let's get her in here. And let her say her piece. And if I feel exercised enough, I may go along and ask some questions and and challenge. But I probably won't, right? But but it doesn't affect me who are coming here. I'm not going to get upset about it. I'm not going to, you know, threaten to cut my wrists because someone with 30 ideas is is coming to New Zealand. And I think we need to be brave and grown up and tell these people who are trying to silence academics or or, um, research or anything grow up. Yeah, I mean, that's at least the classic liberal democratic idea. And I think we've sort of lost our self-confidence weirdly in this because it's, um, I saw Candace Owens trending on Twitter the other day, or X or whatever, and I did look at a video and she was kind of ranting and it made, it like sometimes at least I understand what people are saying, but it made like no sense to me. Mm. So I, I just don't see why people are scared of that because it just seems so dumb, right? Like, <laughs> I, I'm not afraid that people are going to all start agreeing with that because I just think most people will probably... I, I obviously am able to look at something like that without it immediately infecting me and becoming an anti-Semite, right? And I think a lot of New Zealanders would probably just look at that and think, this you're is done. Crazy. She's yeah. done, and you're crazy, and thanks very much. I'll move on to whatever else is in my feed. <laughs> and, th- and this is one of the good. Ar- this is one of the old arguments for free speech. It's actually good to give stupid people, but people with dumb ideas, freedom of speech as well, because it, it gives people information about what they really think and what they're saying. And then if you don't like it, then... You can be like, okay, I, I don't need to, uh, you know, read anything about Candace Owens in the future. There you go. I'm convinced you are dumb. It's it's kind of like that speech that Tucker Carlson did in Australia, where he was being asked stupid questions by by a journalist, and he turned around and he said, you know, I've just met you and you're being rude, and um, but I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You know, I might have thought you were stupid, but I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. And then it went on and on and on, and he says, you know what? I've changed my mind now. I'm not going to give you the benefit of the doubt. You are stupid. You know, but that all all happened because he was willing to be questioned and let the questioner ask the questions to prove to everybody that these were stupid questions. Yeah, I mean, ideally, I guess maybe I'm too high minded, but I would prefer him to actually kind of after we listen to it all to sort of cut down all the arguments on a purely kind of evidence based. Mm. But yeah, I mean, at least he let us speak. I think that was a good thing. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating report and you know, it's it's a lot to to take in, and I'm only just sort of scratched the surface here, but um, I've, I've welcomed your input on this to, as the author of the report, um, and I think, you know, those recommendations that you suggested and, and the, the threats that we have are real, and we need to be looking at those potential solutions, and together with the Free Speech Union, whenever they come out with theirs, I'll hopefully talk to them as well about those solutions, and between the two reports, we try and get somebody in the government to realise that there actually is a problem here in, in New Zealand universities, but it's not an insurmountable problem that it can just yeah. be fixed with some simple things. 
Yeah, and that's really our attitude as well. It's not like universities immediately have to be blown up or you know shut down completely. It's more like there's a problem here. There's also a lot of good stuff going on at universities. We want to reform them in a sensible way. But it's an easy thing to do. You know, that, that's uh, if, there's, if there's political will, I think the, the recommendations that we've made and that maybe the free speech union will make, I think they're definitely, you know, they're realistic. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot. Cheers. I don't know about you, but to those three key areas, the progressive left and its impact on censorship, the malign influence of the CCP in silencing debate and opinions, and the managerialism and safetyism of senior management in universities who are seeking to protect the brand are uh, very concerning. And we should be very vigilant that we can try and nip all of this nonsense in the bud. What do you think? Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR. Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.